Hi, we're at the Thyroid Cancer Survivors Association Conference. I'm here with Dr. Michael Tuttle. Dr. Tuttle, thank you for being here. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm an endocrinologist uh, that works in New York at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. So my entire practice is thyroid cancer. Um, we, about half of my practice is clinical, seeing patients uh, half the week, and the other half is research in various aspects of thyroid cancer. There have been a number of articles recently about watchful waiting instead of surgery for the treatment of smaller tumors or microcarcinomas. When is it better to do surgery instead of surveillance? This is always a uh, difficult question um, because it turns out about half the people in the United States, as soon as they have, find out they have thyroid cancer, they want it out of their neck. They're not interested in talking. They don't want to talk to me. They don't want to do anything. The other half say, well, let's talk about this. Do I, do I really have to have it out right now? And what's the rush to have the thyroid surgery done? So the last four or five years, we've seen a change in how we think about this like many cancers. Many, many of us have family members with prostate cancer that, are, that we're watching carefully or CLL. In thyroid cancer, we've now recognized we can find very small thyroid cancers that are either not going to change at all or change very slowly for many years. And when that's the case, it opens up the door to what we've now called active surveillance. And to begin to ask that question, well, do I need surgery now or potentially do I need surgery at all? So it's, it's a new discussion that we're having to have with patients. So as a thyroid cancer survivor, if we can avoid doing surgery and avoid having someone go on thyroid hormone replacement pills for life, why not do that instead? Yeah, I think that's, a, that's the rationale behind people that want to watch. And, and I certainly find people that have had family members that had thyroid surgery or they know somebody that's had thyroid surgery and had to live on thyroid hormone pills, that they honestly just don't feel the same on thyroid hormone pills. The doctors always say, oh, your blood tests look great. Get out of my office. Everything is fine. Come back and see me. And as you're walking out the door, you go, whoa, 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 wait. I, I feel tired and I've gained 10 pounds. And at the end of the day, I have to work harder to get things to. I just don't feel myself. And we just have to acknowledge that that's true. Um, the thyroid hormones, it, the thyroid gland is an amazing gland. It turns on and off all day for you. And that's not what our pills do. So one of the motivating factors for people that don't want to rush to a surgery is exactly that. They don't want to be on thyroid hormone pills. They want to sort of preserve that thyroid function as long as they can. Other people want to avoid surgery because they don't want a surgery done. And then many people want to treat this on their own. Uh, they use a variety of products and every herb I've never heard of under the planet. They exercise, they get healthy. So they have a very sort of wellness sort of mentality. And they're often asking me, can I try to treat this myself with very non-traditional medicine ways to me to see if they can make things shrink over several months. Does that work? You know, amazingly it does about 10% oh, of the time. Yeah, I, you would have thought I would say no, right? That sounds controversial to me. When they told me they were gonna do that, in my heart of hearts, I kind of smiled and I said, oh, that's cute, that'll never work. Yeah. But out of our series of about 300 patients, about 10 or 15 of those patients, their thyroid cancers actually shrunk while we were watching them. Um, so none of us really understand why that is. Um, maybe it was something they did, maybe that was the natural history. But yes, it's not unheard of to see one of these little small places shrink over time. Let's go back to active surveillance. What's the commitment on the part of the patient if they decide to go that route instead of surgery? So I think it's really important we don't swing the pendulum too far um, because many people hear, oh, it's thyroid cancer, we don't need surgery anymore. That's not true. Right. There's still many patients that need surgery and they need radioactive iodine. But there's a definite group of patients that have the option of not rushing to surgery. So they have to, A, agree that they're gonna live with thyroid cancer in their neck. So there's a mental and a psychologic component to that. It's not only them, their family has to agree to that, their doctors, their friends, so it's sort of that sort of takes a village to do this sort of thing. Um, it has to be the right nodule, so it has to be the right size and the right location. And if all of those things are good, then you need an experienced team that knows how to do this. And it's as easy as repeat ultrasounds every six months for two years. And then after two years, we look and say, did this change? Did it not change? And if it changed, maybe we move towards surgery. If it hasn't changed, then we do the ultrasounds less frequently. We don't repeat biopsies. We don't do any other fancy testing. It pretty much is you do the ultrasound, and if everything stays the same, you get to keep it. If it starts to change, then we know we're moving toward a surgery at some point in the future. 
So can I ask you another question about quality of life issues? We hear a lot, it's a common frustration that many times after surgery we don't feel well and we go to the doctor and the doctor says, but you should feel fine because the numbers look fine, but we know we don't feel well. What should we do in that case? Should we find a new doctor? Uh, many clinicians say, no, your blood tests are fine, you've got to be crazy, this is your family, it's your job, whatever. So one, acknowledging that this is a real phenomenon. Uh, number two, adjusting the thyroid hormone pills. Um, most of the time I can get people feeling relatively good on levothyroxine, the thyroid hormone pills. Be open to other products. I've got people on Armour Thyroid and Mixed Thyroid. I work in Manhattan. We have compounding pharmacies that do T4 and T3. Now, if I'm honest with you, most of the time that doesn't work and they don't feel any better, but sometimes it does. So I think being open and recognizing at least a doctor that says, okay, I, I recognize that's a real phenomenon. I also tell patients our goal is to get you about 90% of normal. If I get you to 100% of normal, I'm going to take credit for it. But we're going to have to recognize if I can get you to 90% of normal, that's going to be your new sort of you after your thyroid surgery. And at 90% of normal, you can do everything you want to do. You may have to work a little bit harder. You may need an hour's sleep. But I've got professional athletes and musicians and, you know, people that every day walk of life do this. So I think it's setting realistic expectations and being willing to work with the patient. Um, some people feel better on a slightly higher dose. Some people feel better on a slightly lower dose. So it's just, it's a process that you just have to work through. You'll find with doctors it's very uncomfortable because we're staring at blood tests and the blood tests look fine. Right. But those blood tests, there's a low end of normal and a high end of normal. And so being willing to work with somebody up and down. And then the last piece of it's patience. Um, every time I change the thyroid hormone dose, it takes a month or two or three to settle in. So we can't be changing as quickly as you want me to. Right. We've got to come up with a plan and say, all right, let's ride this horse for three months, see how we do. And then three months, you tell me, do you feel better now or do you feel better then? We can always come back to home base. We know where your blood tests are normal and then work through that over time. Uh, it's a source of incredible frustration. Um, I hear it every day because I see 15 or 20 thyroid cancer patients a day. Um, and it's one of the number one things they talk to me about once I tell them all the ultrasounds and blood tests are fine. So it, it's a major quality of life issue. For someone who's just been diagnosed with a small tumor or microcarcinoma, what should they know or what should they ask their doctor? So I think part of it is what is small, and that's usually less than a centimeter. Okay. If it's bigger than a centimeter, or if it's got lymph nodes, or if it's growing outside the thyroid, then they're headed down the traditional pathway of surgery and maybe radioactive iodine. If it's smaller than a centimeter, then I think asking the doctor, now wait, slow down just a minute. Um, do we need to biopsy this? Um, do we need to make this diagnosis? If we made the diagnosis, do I need to rush to a surgery? Um, should I go get an opinion from somebody else? Um, am I the right kind of person that would be, you know, open and would be an acceptable person to that observation program? If the doctors don't know the answer to that, then you need to go find somebody else. If they know the answer to that and they can explain to you why you are or not a candidate for that, then that's great. So I think just a asking that question, open up the door, makes doctors that have always rushed to surgery, it kind of gives us permission to go, oh, okay, you're asking about that. Maybe you're interested in that. Let me tell you a little bit more about that. So lately we've also been hearing a lot about overdiagnosis and overtreatment of thyroid cancer patients. What are your thoughts on that? I don't think there's any doubt that we're in a situation now where we're overdiagnosing thyroid cancer. Our, our tools are just too good. We know that 10% of adults in the United States have thyroid cancer, 10%. That's one out of every 10 of your friends. And most people, it never becomes apparent. They live their entire life and nothing happens. But now because of ultrasound and our ability to biopsy these little small nodules, we can now diagnose all these little small nodules. That's a little bit of a judgment to say, is it over diagnosis or not? But in medical terms, if we're diagnosing something that never would become clinically apparent, and honestly would very seldom need to be treated, we call that overdiagnosis. So from a medical term, yeah, there's no question. We're diagnosing two people, too many people. The best example is I've got 400 patients that somebody else biopsied and we chose not to do surgery on, small thyroid cancers. They went from being normal moms and dads and having careers to now being thyroid cancer patients and having to come to New York to see me every year or two. Um, th and they're not gonna change. 95% of those nodules never change. 
And yet, you talk about quality of life issues. We've just told a 30-year-old that they have thyroid cancer. We've told a 50-year-old. And you know how that changes your life and your impact. Um, so I, I think that's where we have to really ask, is it really in the best interest to diagnose all these little small thyroid cancers? Um, I like the idea of not sticking a needle into them. Maybe doing another ultrasound picture in two or three or four years. So that small number that do grow and need to be treated, fine. We found them early, we can treat them. But this rush to diagnose every one of those little places is really just going to create a lot of thyroid surgeries and a lot of people on thyroid hormone. And we're going to have zero impact on mortality and thyroid cancer. So it's always difficult for an individual patient to tell them they're right. overdiagnosed. But when you look at sort of the way we're doing things in medicine right now, it's time to slow down just a little bit and, and ask the question, I don't need to diagnose every thyroid cancer. How do I diagnose the clinically relevant ones? How do I diagnose the ones before they get to lymph nodes? How do I diagnose the ones where the surgery would be much smaller? Uh, that's a much different question than how do I diagnose every thyroid cancer? So you'll see in the guidelines there was a big push toward not biopsying every little small nodule. Right at least having the discussion with the patient, should we biopsy this? And if it does turn out to be cancer, what are we gonna do about it? Um, so I think it, we're kind of moving in the right direction. Um, it's a little bit like a tidal wave, it's a little hard to slow it down, um, but it's been interesting to see how this has played out over the last five years. Dr. Tuttle, this is incredibly helpful information. Thank you so much. Uh, fantastic, thank you very much.